first up we have Matt Vanderme, um, who's gonna be telling us about the closing and replay of the late experiences in the Rack of Champions. Yeah, good morning. Um, talked a little bit about replay so far. It's come up a few times, and you might be under the impression that it's something that is a well-understood phenomenon. Like even the term replay kind of suggests, like, oh yeah, obviously you're gonna have some experience and then and then replay it. Um, you know that makes sense. Um, but I'm gonna talk about some data from our lab and a little bit of background that um, you know maybe suggests that, or it's one of many pieces of evidence that suggests it probably isn't that simple and actually is a really rich phenomenon where we have lots of questions about what's actually going on. Um, so um, we actually have a few different lines of evidence in my lab that I won't uh, sort of, um, sorry, not yet really awake. Um, do a f doing a few different things in the lab um, that I'm not gonna talk about but that are more concerned with inter-aerial information processing in the limbic system. So how information uh, flows is coordinated between different structures like prefrontal cortex, uh, ventral stratum, and the hippocampus. But I won't talk about that today. I'm basically going to be talking about just hippocampus-focused uh, topics. Um, and specifically, I'll start with um, some questions about the content of hippocampal replay. Like if you can replay many different possible things, what determines what you might replay? And if I have time, I'll talk a little bit um, about a project that started as a pop-up lab hackathon project here uh, last year. Um, so you've seen uh, this kind of plot by now. Um, here in gray, you see the trajectory of a rat as it's running one of our teammates' tasks, and then you see these black dots that indicate the location of the rat when this particular neuron fired a spike. And you'll see those spikes tend to be concentrated in this area over here. So we call that the place field, and so this is a classic place cell. Um, for visualization purposes, we can linearize um, this maze. So I take the left trajectory, um, I just unwind it here, and then I just plot the firing rate of this neuron. So firing rate is now number of spikes per second, sometimes referred to as hertz, as a function of this linearized trajectory, and you see like a nicely formed place field. I'm doing that so that I can arrange um, the activity of many of those neurons in this sorted raster plot, where each row is going to show you, first of all, the tuning curve of a one single hippocampal neuron, and then you'll see a tick mark for each time that that neuron fired a spike. And uh, you'll see this red dot indicates the location of the rat as he's going to run along that maze. So if I play this video, you'll also hear some sound effects where I've arranged it so that the uh, pitch of the tone is corresponding to where the neuron has its firing field. So you should hear this overall progression as the rat runs down this track. And basically you see what you would expect that, you know, the rat enters a field and then exits, and it encounters a new field, exits that. So you get kind of this smooth progression through a bunch of place fields. Um, now nothing about this should be particularly surprising. It's sort of a straightforward consequence from, you know, the fact that place fields have, are sort of distributed throughout an environment. Um, but one interesting thing you can do with this is now you can say, well, what would a memory sound like? So now we have the rat just hanging out in its home cage, and there isn't a whole lot of activity going on. You know, a few spikes here and there. But then, you hear the same sort of progressions, um, indicating that even though the animal isn't actually moving, there's activation in the same order as cells were active during actual behavior. Um, so this is, of course, the classic you know, replay phenomenon. Um, and it contrasts um, with activity during behavior. Like Dave Reddish me mentioned, you, know, you have these theta sequences, like short repeating sequences when the animal's actually moving around um, that continuously are occurring when the animal is engaged in some kind of task. But in contrast, like you saw from that video, you know, replay is a much more kind of punctate phenomenon where for a while, like nothing seems to be happening and then all of a sudden there's this kind of burst that then within that burst has some structured activity. Um, now these replay events are associated with uh, a feature of the local field potential called a sharp wave ripple. So I will often say sharp wave ripples or just ripples for short to indicate you know, those kind of population bursts that are often associated with replay. Not all of those population bursts have structured activity that like I showed you. you know, in an actual experiment, like you might observe you know, hundreds of sharp wave ripples but only have a few percent of them kind of trace out a, a nice sequence that corresponds to the maze that you know, you had your rat run on. Um, 
I showed you one that occurred in the same order as the rat's actual behavior, so that's referred to as a forward replay, but you also get reverse replay. Um, and then you might have a replay that includes the animal, animal's current location, like maybe even start from where the animal currently is. Um, but it's also possible for a replay to replay experiences that uh, perhaps are on the other side of the room or even a different room entirely. And again, that makes sense if you think about like various memory functions, like your, your memory is not limited to only recalling things that occur in this room, even though because you're in it now, you might be biased or cued towards recalling such events. Um, so these are some of the basic properties uh, of replay. Um, the typical story that people tell about why you might construct a brain or a brain structure that replays is they'll say, well, uh, it's really useful for uh, something called systems consolidation, where maybe when you have an experience only once, you kind of need a short-term memory buffer, like you need a structure that's specialized in laying down a short-term memory trace. But then you have all kinds of other brain structures that would benefit from uh, kind of a repeated replay of that experience, or you can extract some statistical regularities that you have a fast learning and a slow learning system that, that those are kind of complementary for solving many kinds of problems. So maybe hippocampus facilitates that by specializing in that fast storage, but then also basically training up like other parts in the brain by, by replaying. Um, another idea is maybe uh, it's actually more like memory retrieval, that that replay is actually just retrieving a specific episode of, oh, this one time, like I ran down this particular arm and maybe I got reward. Um, another idea is that maybe it's something more like working memory, where you actively keep in memory what the last trial was or the last thing that you did. And yet another idea is saying, well, maybe it's more like a plan that, you know, when you're um, Dave Reddish style, like deliberating between going to this restaurant or uh, going to this other one, you know, maybe you prospectively simulate paths you would need to take to get there. Um, and there's basically evidence for all these kind of ideas. Um, I'm going to focus, like I was inspired by this idea of, well, maybe there could be a role for these events in planning. And um, I want to formalize a little bit um, what that would look like. Um, so Kim yesterday already introduced this idea um, of reinforcement learning in some state space, where you imagine, you know, maybe you start here, this is a state like being at the start of the maze, and then you can go left and right, and you end up in a new state, and maybe if you take a specific combination of choices, then you might encounter some rewards. And you can learn basically from repeated experience what values are associated with um, these states and with these actions. So perhaps if you're hungry and you take lots of choices in this maze, have lots of feedback, then eventually you figure out that this state is more valuable than that state, and that sort of gets propagated back here. And then when you're in this state, you know that this action is associated with a higher expected future reward than this one. And that seems all fine, except one of the sort of many problems with doing this in the real world is that um, if your motivational state changes, it's not clear how you would use the values that you've learned while you're hungry to then do the right thing when you're thirsty. Um, so this is one scenario that might benefit from some kind of planning where if you had a model of this environment that allowed you to simulate, well, even though you're physically in this state, your hippocampus can simulate what happened if you turn right and then left. Oh, then I expect that I would get water. Maybe I currently really want that. I can sort of evaluate on the fly that that's a currently valued reward. Then you, know, you have a more flexible decision system that can do the right thing even when revaluations or motivational shifts happen. But the trade-off is thought to be that this might be slow, especially in large state spaces where there are many possible trajectories, like how are you going to simulate all those different trajectories? Maybe you know, that's going to be hard. Um, but there is this idea out there supported by you know, a variety of different kinds of data that maybe sharp wave ripples and the associated replay somehow contributes to this type of planning. Um, so we asked, uh, what is the effect of doing these kind of motivational shifts on the content of replay? Um, Specifically, my student Alyssa did the following thing. Um, she had this tea maze where one arm was always associated with food and the other arm was always associated with water. And we're going to give the rats a uh, free choice where you know, they start here and they can basically do whatever they want. We're just measuring their preference of where would they like to go. But before they go in the maze each day, there is this rest period where we just record lots of sharp wave ripples. And also after the task, there's a rest period where we record some more. And then, you know, as uh, animals are alternately water restricted or food restricted, um, we basically get to measure is there any effect of changing that motivational state 
on the content of replay, of whether there's a bias towards replaying that left uh, food or the right water trajectory. Um, so what does the behavior look like? Um, we sort of make these kind of plots where uh, it's sort of complicated because there's two axes here, and that's because we first show you separately for all the sessions where the animals were food restricted, um, you know, what, what, what do they prefer? And you see um, this vertical line basically indicates a strong bias to the left towards the food. On the water restriction sessions, um, you get a strong bias towards the right. And these dots are individual sessions. So there are some water restriction sessions where, or they're, where they're basically 50-50. There are others where they had a strong preference. And then you can compute a difference, like what, what was the behavior on the food restriction minus the water restriction sessions. And you see a difference that's clearly different from zero. So this gray area is sort of the distribution you would expect from randomly shuffling the food and water restriction labels. Right? So behaviorally, the animals do what you would expect, that they go for the reward that they've been restricted of. Um, and then here's what that looks like if you just look within a session across trials. Then on trial one, they don't necessarily have a really strong preference. So it seems like that, that first trial, there's something different than um, on future trials where then they express their preference more clearly. So they're perhaps not perfectly rational rats in this task where you might expect them to, on the first trial, already immediately do the opposite um, or choose the like, thing they've been restricted of. Um, OK, so now we get to record from the hippocampus and identify these kind of replay events. So there's a whole lot of methods sort of underlying it. Um, but here you can just see some examples of the type of diagonal structure that you also saw in the video. And basically what we end up doing is um, decoding that pattern of spikes and mapping it onto uh, a location in space that you could sort of see here. So these are probability distributions over time where you see a nicely peaked kind of sequence that then we have a metric for saying, well, how, how much does this favor the left trajectory over the right trajectory? So this would be a case where it's very clearly a left biased event. Whereas here's an event that sort of looks similar on both left and right. So this doesn't distinguish clearly between the two trajectories. So we have a way of scoring and then taking into account um, you know, how much does each event contribute to an overall metric of how much does the replay in a particular epoch uh, bias towards left or the right. And I can tell you lots more about all the steps that are involved in that. If you're doing a project involving replay, you might implement a bunch of these steps yourself. But basically, we use two different methods. Um, one that takes into account the actual sequence, so we can determine is this forward or reverse. And another that uh, really decodes the event sort of as one single time bin, so it totally ignores any sequential structure. Um, so if we do all that and end up with a measure that basically says, uh, how much does the sharp wave ripple content bias towards the left or the right, um, you can make a plot like this, where in black, you see the animals um, experience on the maze that day. So on the water restriction day, you know, they choose mostly food. Uh, on the food restriction day, um, sorry, on the water restriction day, they don't choose very much food. So this behavior plot is down here. Then on the food restriction day, they choose mostly food. So you get the zigzag effect. But then the surprise was that the sharp wave ripple content seemed to be anti-correlated with that behavior. Um, so that was the first surprise. Um, this is now averaged over the whole session. Um, so you might say, well, maybe that's just because they're carrying something over from the previous day. Like, we really need to understand on a finer time scale, um, you know, what does this look like? So we're going to break it out by this pre-task rest. We're going to have a separate epoch for the intertrial intervals, and then another epoch for the post-task rest. So um, sorry, now you end up with something like this. So uh, pre-task intertrial interval and post-task. And this is now in the type of plot that was similar to behavior, where on food restriction days, um, sharp wave ripple content was biased in the water direction. On water restriction days, content was biased in the food direction. And this didn't reverse or change with experience at all. So even though if it's a food restriction day, they're going to run lots of food trials, that experience didn't actually change the content of replay. Like even after experience on the task, there was still this bias in the opposite direction. Um, and likewise, one another way to think about it is that uh, this bias preceded experience on that day. That um, even though the animals hadn't run any trials yet that day, there already was a bias towards the opposite arm from the one that they were going to prefer behaviorally. Um, 
So again, there's a bunch of statistics underlying this to show, well, this doesn't actually change, but you can sort of see it visually too, that it's a very stable kind of preference in replay content over that session, including before experience and after experience. Um, now you can do the same sort of analysis using uh, the sequence-based measure so that we can separately analyze uh, forward and reverse replay. But basically you see all the same things. So again, behavior looks like this. Um, it's a little bit of a weaker effect here, but you still see the overall anti-correlation. You also see in these kind of plots, um, I'm actually not sure if I have this one here, um, but forward and reverse replay basically all look identical here. So there seems to be this consistent opposite bias compared to what the animals are behaviorally preferring and to what the animals actually are experiencing, right? So sort of the naive idea that either replay is just going to reflect some sort of recency weighted experience or that replay is going to reflect what the animal is about to do, at least in this particular setup, like those things are not good explanations of replay content. And um, there's a whole bunch of methodological confounds that we had to deal with. I just want to give you a, a slight sense of it um, because this is after all a methods course. Um, you can imagine that the animal has in its hippocampus kind of two true maps of what how left and right trials are encoded. So I'm visualizing that kind of as a set of idealized tuning curves. Um, but we never get to see what these perfect tuning curves look like because we can only access them through our imperfect experimental setup where we only have limited time, where the animals do all kinds of strange things on the maze. So we might get a noisy version of those tuning curves. And then on top of that, we're also not recording from all the place cells. So we get a neural sampling where we only get a subset. And so if any of these processes, like the behavioral sampling of what the animal does on different parts of the maze or our neural sampling of like how many cells we record or what the properties of those cells are, if those are unbalanced, then you could potentially bias your interpretation of this replay because you might end up with a situation where if you had you know, 10 cells here and five cells here, you might naively find that you have m way more replay on this side than that side when that doesn't actually reflect the underlying like true replay content. Right? So there's many, many control analysis that you have to do to rule out like those type of alternative explanations. And I think there's sort of an elegant way of um, doing that that we described in a methods paper from 2017. Um, but basically you can come up with a null hypothesis for what the replay content is that you would expect given that the true replay is 50-50. So you're basically revealing the effects of the biases that were due to your behavior on neural sampling. And that's what this plot shows where we can plot a decoding error separately for food restriction and water restriction sessions of is there a difference in how accurately we, we can decode left and right trials when we know the right answer, when the animal is actually running around there. And so we find actually that there is some bias here that on the food restriction sessions, we have a larger error on the water side and on the water restriction sessions, we have larger error on the food side. But that's actually in the opposite direction from the actual data. So this decoding error would predict this kind of distribution of observed replays even when the true replay distribution has no preference, right? Because we're kind of viewing true replay through this distorted lens of introducing errors that aren't the same on two sides. So in our, we might have observed this in the data and said, oh, everything fits our hypothesis perfectly. Like replay is biased towards the thing that the animals choose. Um, but actually the data um, you know, does not look like this, right? What we actually see is that despite uh, our a slight bias in our analysis, we see you know, this opposite bias. So it's just an example of the kind of methods issues that you have to deal with when you decode replay and try to compare, is there more representation of left versus right? Um, okay, I'm gonna skip a couple of things, but um, mention one more point that, um, now I already mentioned it looks like this replay content doesn't fit the hypothesis that replay is proportional to recent experience, right? And you can easily see that once I explain to you how this plot works. Um, so replay content is plotted here. You know, this is time. And so what we see um, in the data is this dotted line that basically replay content doesn't change like throughout the pre-task, task, and post-task, but then it flips when we come back the next day. Whereas ex an experience dependent scenario would predict that it should change during a session and in fact, that it should change, um, well, that it should change more quickly than 
um, how this changes. But you could say, well, maybe it's a delayed version of experience, right? Like what if replay just takes some time to catch up with this change? And you can imagine like shifting over you know, this actually experienced plot and then it would kind of fit the observed data. Um, so there we take advantage of the fact that uh, some days the animal uh, is pretty biased in its preferences. Like there's a very strong preference, say, for choosing the water. So then you would expect um, a big change in the update and replay content compared to a case where the animal is basically 50-50, right? Say in this session there's only a very small bias, then you wouldn't expect to see much of a jump in the replay the next day. So we can compare basically these alternative models and say, well, which one is the best fit for the data? And somewhat strikingly, the pre-task uh, replay bias is not predictable by behavior the previous day, but it does predict the upcoming behavior. Right? So if replay content is proportional to experience, then you would expect what you did yesterday before you have another experience in that room, that should be driving the content of replay. But that those, those variables aren't connected. Whereas if you think that replay has something to do with the upcoming task, then you would expect that the stronger you're biased one way, then in this case, you're actually more likely to go the opposite way. So we, we do have a predictive relationship between uh, pre-task replay bias and then what the animal will do in the subsequent behavioral block. Um, Okay, so to sum up, the simple proposals about what drives the content of replay may explain you know, a whole bunch of data, but you can engineer strange situations like this one where that theory doesn't work, right? This, this isn't explained by recent experience or a plan of what the animal will do next. So maybe it's something that gives us a little bit of a handle on what replay might be doing more generally. Um, it would be interesting to think about what, what kinds of normative theories or alternative ideas might there be that can make sense of something like this. Then in the future, we also want to do um, versions of this experiment where we can be more confident that the task actually depends on the hippocampus, right? Because one limitation of doing this, well, sure, you can record replay, but we don't really know what strategy the animal is using to solve this task. Like maybe somehow stratum was actually driving behavior on this task and hippocampus can kind of do whatever it wants. And then maybe it makes sense to do more of a sort of internal exploration of saying, well, I know I'm going to do this, but what would it be like to do this other thing? I mean, these are all speculations that we can test with experiments that, yeah, isolate the role of the hippocampus and this sort of thing. Okay, and in the last few minutes, um, I want to highlight briefly um, this project that we started last year, which is more about how ongoing experience is encoded. So not about offline replay of left and right arms, but saying, well, as you're experiencing this kind of task, um, how are these left and right trials uh, reflected in the activity of the hippocampus? Um, and you might, you might think, well, some, some people have proposed that in hippocampus, you basically put down fields in random locations, and there might be no relationship between what fields are active at what place on the left or on the right. Or you might think there should be some kind of correlation because after all, they're pretty similar, right? They're sort of, you're on the same kind of maze, like in the same room. Um, and so Hung Tu, um, and also together with Jeremy, um, we asked this question, okay, if you make this big matrix here where for left and right arms, you make their tuning curves, and we only use the tuning curves from after this choice point, um, well, what is the relationship between the tuning curves on the left and the right? So you can just correlate uh, the left half of each row with the right half of each row and plot that average correlation. You say on average, you know, that correlation is basically zero. Um, so even though there are some neurons that are correlated because you know, they sort of have a symmetric tuning curves, there are others that anti-correlate and it sort of all averages out. And likewise, if you make a population vector correlation matrix, so you correlate each column with every other column, um, then you see that within left and right arms, there's a diagonal that has some width. So nearby locations are correlated, as you might expect. But there isn't an obvious diagonal um, in these off diagonal quadrants, right? If left and right were identically encoded, then you would see a big diagonal here. Now, there might be a little something here. Maybe we should look at that. Um, but the intuition that was inspired by uh, Jim Haxby is to say, well, it looks like Predicting left from right in a single subject is pretty tricky. I just showed you all these like very close to zero correlations. But what about if there's some shared structure across subjects? So 
the way that works is you could say, well, for a given rat, um, you can take these matrices and do dimensionality reduction so that a run through, the, uh, through this track becomes a trajectory in this reduced neural space. So here is uh, left and here is right, or maybe the other way around, but you get the idea. There's these two trajectories. Then you take another rat with some different number of neurons, but you do dimensionally reduction down to the same number of principal components. And for that rat too, you see these two trajectories. And these trajectories now live in a subject-specific principal component space, right? There's no real reason to expect that what this, this space has anything to do with that space. But now we can do hyperalignment. So remember Haxby's movies where you, know, you take a space and you rotate the axes until you get the closest possible alignment. So you can do that here. You could say, well, we're going to take this space and just rotate it until these trajectories are as close together as we're going to get them using, for instance, that Procrustes transformation that Jim mentioned. So now um, you can come up with a common space where for each individual you have a matrix that projects its activity into that common space. And now you can play interesting games like if we know from rat one like what transformation relates left to right, we can go to rat two's left trials apply that transformation and have a predicted right trajectory for our target subject. And then we can compare that to various kind of shuffles or uh, other sources of prediction, like project out of that common space back to PCA space for that individual and reconstruct that original matrix. Um, and basically, after a lot of you know, shuffles and controls, it looks like there's some indication that this works better than if you break the relationship between left and right trials in the source subject. So the, the source transformation is now some kind of random transformation. Um, the actual prediction works better than that. So this is like proportion of su source target pairs where we do better than that shuffle. Here's a matrix um, showing that proportion across all possible pairs. Again, there's a lot of work sort of behind this saying, well, what are the sources of why this works, right? Is it enough to have some cells that have similar firing rates or is it enough that some cells have uh, a field in the same place. Basically, Hung Tu ran a lot of simulations where uh, you know, we set up fake place cells that have particular properties and asked under what conditions can this work, what normalizations might allow us to isolate, whether it's really differences in rate or difference in location. So this is very much a work in progress. But I think if it turns out that this holds up or if we uh, can figure out what the source of it is, it's sort of a different view on this idea of hippocampal remapping that's often thought of as a totally random process within an individual when there's actually some kind of shared structure across subjects. Right? So this is what we're trying to establish. To what degree can these hippocampal remapping phenomena of where you put what cell actually be predictable and maybe relate to some coding of shared structure like a hierarchy of which room you're in or some generalization between left and right um, or other kinds of interesting cognitive phenomena. Um, so will that. Um, I'll just point out the code for all this stuff, um, at least when it's on BioArchive or published, is on um, our lab GitHub. Uh, the data is available, um, and we have this great summer course that you should attend. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, like pseudo random or yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so in retrospect, because we really didn't expect to see this thing, we didn't design the experiment that way. So we, in this data set, we sort of addressed it by statistical analysis, but I agree that it would be nicer to do it by design. Um, when we did start out this experiment, we started out with a pseudo-random uh, motivational shift, and that was really hard to get to work behaviorally. So in the current version of the experiment, that also has uh, a north and a south start arm, so that we encourage a hippocampus-dependent strategy. Um, in that version, we have exactly like you said, like two food restriction days, two water restriction days, so that at least, uh, yeah, we can pull out these different factors more clearly. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, uh, Leonard, I'll, I'll
I'll try to do students first, and then I've seen you both. So they're always in the same location because we reasoned, you know, we want, we want the animal to know where it can find those rewards. We just want to access, you know, in its replay or internally, like, what trajectories does it prefer. Immediately infer, yeah, 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 right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think that's a really interesting question that also things like, you know, serial reversal learning kind of address that, okay, if the animal has enough experience with this sort of task, like, yeah, it's clear that there are really two, only two things, and if one doesn't work, then you're doing the other, and maybe that is a prerequisite for this kind of opposite replay thing, that the task is understood as something binary of like, okay, we're, we're either doing this or we're doing that. And yeah, I guess some ways to probe that would be like, oh, if we had a, a task that had multiple such state, or states like three, <laughs> would you then get like replay of the two things that you didn't do or would you, yeah, I guess there's a few different hypotheses there. Yeah, yeah, I like that idea. Sam and then Kim. Yeah, so I guess something really basic, like some kind of adaptation where if you have a brain system that's concerned with, okay, I'm going left, and you know, it is sort of continuously providing some input to like those cells in the hippocampus that encode left. Um, you know, if, is there some way of then uh, kicking in enough like adaptation in those cells so that there's a bias towards the other side? Like that, that could be one way. or it could be a more active kind of process where you'd say, well, there's a kind of controller that uh, keeps track of something like the uncertainty about one or the other um, outcome and say, well, if we already know we're doing this thing, we have high certainty that that's going to be a great reward, then there's more uncertainty about the unchosen option, right? You haven't been there for a longer amount of time, like that sort of thing. But how that connects to a circuit mechanism, I guess, is a lot less clear. Yeah, grateful for suggestions. I guess the correct answer is lateral inhibition, but how exactly <laughs> that works, I'm not sure. <laughs> Yeah, you, you do see some of them, though. Um, but but there's, there's more information than just the places being here, right? Like yeah, so, so one of the comparisons we do is what we call like, just the like, identity prediction, where you just take the tuning curves on the left, and that then is your prediction for the right, and various rescalings of those things. Okay. So yeah, we, we check that the hyper-aligned prediction outperforms like those kinds okay. of simple predictions. Yeah, yeah so, so I'm curious, would be with the, yeah. beyond just the mirroring, is there any structure, like what areas are better predicted? based on information that's not just mirrored, or which areas yeah, on the yeah. other side are mirrored. Yeah, like is it like the end or the choice point? Yeah. So I'm to make the plot like that. I don't know if he's here currently. I don't remember what it looked like. Um, I think there was a little bit of a tendency for uh, the prediction to be, oh, okay, I don't want to say it wrong, so maybe I'll just finish it. <laughs> there was some small change somewhere, like, it, you know, it, we, we were going to have it as a supplementary figure or something. I haven't looked at it in a while. Uh, Claire? How general do you think that transformation from that, right? And so yeah. <laughs> we tried it in other ways. Great hackathon project. So we, we tried it on um, a different maze, like some data that I actually collected when I was in Dave Regis's lab. There was also a T-maze. And it had the property that there were way more of those mirroring cells that just seemed to be symmetric, like on both arms. And in part, that was because we designed this T-maze to have the arms be much more distinct. So we had different cues on the left and the right. Um, in that case, you know, the hyperalignment prediction worked in the sense that it outperformed the shuffle, but it did not outperform this identity prediction because there were so many cells that had these symmetric tuning curves. But I think a really great question also, if somebody wants to do it here, is to try this kind of analysis on perhaps Sam's data where it has you know, room A and room B, right? That if within a rat, uh, you can find out what the transform is between those rooms, does that generalize? Or even like an idea that always seemed intriguing to me is there also like a temporal operator. You'd say, well, is between subjects 
how you convert file n plus one share, right? Or yeah, things like division in your other cognitive operators. So yeah, I think it's a cool idea to say, yeah, how general is it? What underlies that? Um, yeah. Cool. All right. We'll take that one more time.